Warrior Lodges of the Horus Heresy. A meeting that could not, should not, have happened. A moment in time. A turning of the past to something darker by far. But none were to know it then. Not then. Before the universe went mad. But in no small part, this very meeting smoothed the pathway to damnation. Before we begin, a short word from our sponsor, as fast as I could make it. Raid Shadow Legends, where you too can be a legend. The mobile game dominating the world of adventure, and it's so easy to slay a few monsters on a break, or dive in and play for hours. Playable on mobile and desktop, it's the cream of the crop. With dungeons, raids, guilds and adventures, this is your one-stop shop for high adventure. And there is now the Doom Tower, a challenge to even the experienced player. Well, I shall let you explore for yourselves. And this month brings us Forge Pass Season 3. You can get a time-limited artifact set and Madame Ceres, plus additional skins, but more. The legendary Death Knight has been buffed to the high heavens. He is now a veritable Cardinal of Whoop. And you can get him free if you log into Raid for seven days between now and October the 27th. You can also use the promo code DKRISES to instantly max out said Death Knight. Lovely. So what are you waiting for? Use the links in the description or the QR code, the techno thingy on screen, to get started. And if you do, you will gain bonuses worth $30 totally free, including free epic champion, Vergis, 200k silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost and one ancient shard, so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. Raid Shadow Legends. Start your legend today. And finally, be aware that on Tuesday, we drop our first full video for living mythology. Obviously, it won't be to everyone's taste, but if you like our storytelling style, then it could be for you. Myself and Gremlin Girl, or Lightbringer, as she will now be known, have worked incredibly hard on it. As with all things, it will improve with experience and time. And now, back to the story. Elements of three legions had met in space to deal with an empire of Xenos, of aliens. The Iron Warriors, Emperor's Children and Death Guard. Joint operations with the Order of the Day. For efficiency, for effectiveness, for learning opportunities, was how it was projected. But none believed this. Not really. This would be everything just mentioned, of course. But in reality, at its core, it was a competition. Who was best? Which legion most effective? And from that one decision, that one meeting, came another. Three middle-rank officers were forced into a collaboration that none thought would work. Certainly not in the way it was touted to, at least. Oh, it was seen by many as a joke, a wager, a jape, for each of the higher commanders had their troublesome officers. Each had their loyal, dangerous men, who were simply too useful to ignore. Too deadly to leave on the side when a battle hove into view. And yet, they would each regularly irk their superiors. It would needle, harangue, or merely annoy their peers. So, in their infinite wisdom, the officers above them in the three legions had obviously met of Amasek one night. Trading gripes, swapping stresses, and each had named the thorn in their side. For now, they had been ordered to work together, these thorns. Something that their superiors would consider poetic justice. And if any of them broke the rules, 
then there would be the context, the reason to bust them down to a level where they would not be a concern anymore, at least to those directly above them. And thus, they were ordered to meet to plan a coordinated strike. Like throwing three bears into the one cave, their upper officers secretly hoped they would end their own careers then and there. For they had begun to gain reputations. All three of them were known as some of the most truculent in their legion, but also the most talented. Hexamel Quiridion, the Oath Keeper, Centurion of the Emperor's Children, Tarax Antarax, the Cudgel, Centurion of the Iron Warriors, and of course, the most notorious of them all, Ulic the Unreasonable, chosen of the Pale King, Centurion of the Death Guard. Man, nobody who knew any of them, let alone all of them, believed that this assignation would end in anything but bloodshed. Non-lethal, of course. Marine did not kill Marine. But a healthy something could be meted out by any one of them. There was only one question in the mind of the three separate squads of Honor Guard, each now standing a tight snap outside. Who was the bigger bastard? Each guard would swell when they thought of it. For despite their exteriors, their reputations, these three officers looked after their own in different ways. Tarax, the cudgel, kept his men in line. In the Iron Warriors, he was strength. Quiet, simmering anger, ready to be unleashed at the tip of a hat. A brutal man, who had no love of the goals of the Crusade, no in a compass. He took orders and efficiently executed them, but with a spite that really stood out. Some said that he should be transferred to the Eighth, only to be informed that he had been seconded there for over a decade previously. None were surprised. Hexamel, the Oath Keeper, was as good as his word every time. He never varnished his answers or his instructions. But he gained glory for those under him, those who survived, like a veritable river. None had more oaths of moments satisfied than he, in his own fleet, perhaps in his legion, some said the crusade. But that was impossible, surely. But Hexamel had been in the crusade since the early days, he was eldest of the three by far. The war cry of his guard was not death or glory. It was death and glory. For both were always present in his actions in abundance. Ah, and Ulic. None knew his last name, not even his guard. And they adored him. Because he kept them alive. He spared them no hardships but never, ever wasted them. Raw recruits, subpar squads, oh yes, they were like chaff to him, spent easily, but not his honor guard. And he was known as the unreasonable, a tepid subriquet for most, but in the world of the Astartes, to be deemed as unreasonable by fellow space marines, it was not something to scoff at, not one jot. He decimated for fun, is what some said, but none ever questioned Ulrich. Even his titular officers avoided his ire. Every single time he was hauled before his Primarch, they bantered. Yes, the Pale King singled him out and always, always spoke of three sips Ulrich. But none other could call him this. And the protection of his Primarch meant no officer would chasten him. Yet, he was one of the best leaders, the most efficient and skilled warriors in his legion. And strangely to all others, the guards of these horrors, they were loyal, sometimes beyond reason. 
to each of those officers who were so despised amongst their own rankers. Jealousy, insults, just being outshone, outfought was enough. And the three of these horrors were in the same room, attempting to gain an accord. For the styles of the three legions were worlds apart. Any accord could be a challenge, but between these three forces of nature, none expected a good result. None. The three groups of marines, their honor guards, outside did not glare at each other. The 20 Death Guard tactical marines, the 10 Terminators of the Iron Warriors, the usually jump pack wearing squad that supported Hexamel. They paid a grudging respect to their colleagues, but they did not wish to get close, so to put it. All expected a nasty event, potentially very complicated. It was unheard of for Astartes to fight, but they were not normal Astartes, any of them. The tension was finally cut like a knife when one of the Emperor's children merely snorted softly and whispered all too loudly so all could hear him. So, how long do we give it before they kill each other? A few repressed chortles from all. An iron warrior mouthed. That room contains the meanest cusses in the crusade. But the question is, which of them is the biggest bastard? Spontaneously, each of the score of death guards said as one, thumping their hands on their leg guards. Ulik. But each beamed as they did so. Pride. They were proud of him. Oh, we'll see, said the Emperor's children. But then all cut off. The Astartes each hunched a tiny as a crash came from the room inside. Then, a noise so loud, so boisterous, that none could fathom it, none expected. And within the clangor were three different voices, three separate laughs. Inside that room, all three men were laughing. At not fake titters or chortles, but loud berry roars, genuine laughter. At first, the Marines outside looked at each other stunned. Some of them had never heard them laugh at all. Then the Emperor's children, Astartes, sardonically said, <laughs> Birds of a feather. He then looked round at the gallery of all of them and said, Okay, nobody spills about this. Not one word. A few tortles followed again, and a retort came from a death guard. Who would we tell? Who would believe us? They all snapped back up to attention as the doors opened. The three officers walked out, now stern again. But as they reached the threshold, they each in turn took the other's forearm in the warrior's clasp. And despite their differing visages, height, shapes, buff on their armors, they looked unified. They looked the same. Yet their only similarity at all was a small pouch on their hips, a trinket inside each, a lodge medallion. And, of course, the wolfish leer on each of their faces. A shudder went down the back of all of their squads, because if they were laughing, if they were looking forward to this, it meant one of the hardest fights of their lives. To be continued. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and features of the 30k universe and the Horus Heresy, where the age of knowledge and enlightenment has ended and the age of darkness has begun. The Great Crusade, a time of legend, when the Emperor and his sons, the Primarchs, walked to the decks of battle barges and great flagships when they all bestrode the stars at the head of their mighty exploratory fleets 
but they were all armed to the teeth for expansion, for conquest. Their legions of Astartes, the Space Marines, had no drive except victory. Few can understand the mind of a Marine, for there is no place there for love, attraction, family or future. There is only one drive. Conquest. Obedience, loyalty, honour, brotherhood. All replaced that of normal men's needs to an extent of being fixations. When one cannot leave behind a legacy of life, a family and friends, then all they were left with was the moment and a legacy of death. Of defeating their enemies, those identified by the will of the Emperor and his Primarchs. Action was all. Valor was breath. Duty, food, discipline. The sinew of the Crusade. But victory was at its heart. The drive for it. The justifications for it. For no matter how it was explained or deemed required in future tracts, the Crusade was a war of utter domination, not revenge. And only failure was unacceptable. For only that. The World Eaters butchered their way across recalcitrant stars. The Iron Warriors bled men as fast as the army. The Eighth, the Ninth Lords, brought terror to all they faced, scaring the few to cow the many. But at the cost of populations that were now docile, utterly. The March of War led from node to node, Mandeville Point to Mandeville Point, from system to system. And all fell to the crusade. For if they were matched in power, the Primarchs tipped the balance, leading like virtuosos. Each battlefield, each fleet action, a pantomime that they could control within minutes, totally dominate within hours. They were unstoppable. Thus it was that the only thing that could match the Astartes were other Astartes. None thought it possible. Most believed it unthinkable for Marines to kill Marines. Yet the rot crept in so subtly, so surreptitiously. The seed that fell between the mighty bedrock that was the Legion. But the seeds grew. They wheedled their way up into the very heart and head of the Legions. And it all started with the Warrior Lodges. Such a simple thing. A place where men of the Legions could gather as equals, as friends. For in the lodges, all rank was left at the door. A Marine could speak candidly and openly with a captain. As brothers, as I said, as friends. It sounded so logical, so simple, so pure. And the Primarchs around the main blast point all took on these lodges, even headed them up because it allowed them to feel a fraternity deeper than any other that they had experienced. For here was family, not just camaraderie, but true brotherhood. And thus the entire fabric of the crusade slowly unraveled. For it was always meant to be a pyramidal structure, with the emperor at its apex, all loyalty going up, only being shone down from on high. And that was not real. The Marines loved their Emperor. He was their warrior king. He had fought alongside them, at their head many a time. Yet, when the legions raised on terror were replaced because of casualties, by influxes of recruits from the home worlds of the found Primarchs, the fractures began in many a legion. But the lodges blew those cracks wide open. Because the mountain had been flattened out, the hierarchy seen for what it was, and it had less power, less hold on the new marines. Because of the warrior launches, and far less in the later years, for the emperor stepped back. But even before that, but even before that, his primarchs and their legions were spread ever further and ever more distant. Thus many had not seen the emperor. They held loyalty to their Primarch and their Legion. The Lodges made this crack a chasm, for when they became true brothers, 
Their loyalty to those up top was reassigned to those men at their shoulder. They had always been professional, effective, concerted, but the Lodges dissipated their unquestioning loyalty to the Emperor alone. Now, they had their legion, their Primarch, and their Lodge. And of course, their Emperor. But when too many loyalties are acquired, some fade, lessen in power. And as the memory of the Emperor in his full wrath and splendor diminished, then he became a distant myth on terror, and far less a personage of veneration. And thus the Brotherhoods grew binds deeper with their Primarchs and fellows, and they were ready to fall. Because the Primarchs of many legions were infected with the same ideas, questioning their loyalty, some due to fear of censure from a wrathful Emperor when they had strayed, Petrabo, Conrad, but others out of years of built-up resentment. And when they turned to their men, their Astartes, their brothers of the Lodges, the spell was broken, and the majority of them went over and into rebellion. Not all, but enough. The Lodges bred so many patterns into the Marines, slowly preparing them for their full conversion to the Dark Powers. They gathered at secretive places where only the initiated could enter, thus creating dishonesty in the legions. The place would usually be guarded by a warden in robes of some form, cult-like they would meet, harmless in its conception, some might say. But this would erode authority on the battlefield, and again, open the doors to insurrections or mutinies of smaller proportions. That would then make the larger heresy or betrayal easier. They identified as us, and everyone outside the lodges as them. It destroyed order, discipline, the chain of command, and perpetually nudged the boundaries further with every meeting. Tiny, tiny steps on the pathway to hell. But where did they come from? Simple. The first heretic and his sons, his ilk. The word bearers. And they knew what they were doing. In no time at all. The excesses of the Emperor's children dining after a battle was sickening. The micro-ritualizations prepared all for the grander rites to come. They were ever so slowly nudged off the path of purity but it only took hold in some legions, those that went over to Horus most notably. But even the great Khan and his white scars had his rebellion of those pledged to the lodges and through them to Horus himself, the arch-traitor, the war master. And this template is still used even now in the grim darkness of the far future, the hidden small cliques, the lodges, cults and movements, the rot that inevitably leads all to the feet of the Dark Gods as their puppets. The Inquisition root them out as swiftly as they can, but in the dark expanses of the galaxy, there are always more threats than there are agents of the Emperor. And year by year, they become more canny, more subtle, and thus more dangerous. As the galaxy slowly, inexorably marches towards the Rana Dandra, the wolf time, the time of ending, the final battle. I have been Baltimore to your faithful servant, and I hope you have enjoyed this brief introduction to the warrior lodges of the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. If so, then do please consider liking and subscribing. And as stated before, we do have a new channel starting on Tuesday, Living Mythology, and of course, our other channel, GK Natural History. All links in the description. Thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.